In this presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about anthropological approaches to class or socioeconomic status in inequality in America. We'll go through this presentation pretty quickly. So take a look at this photograph uh, from downtown Hamilton in the 1930s. What do you see? You guessed it a communist rally in front of the downtown YMCA in February of 1933. Today, Hamilton and Butler County are politically conservative, so it's hard to imagine that communism ever would have had a foothold here. This suggests that class consciousness in formerly industrial Hamilton was more present in the past. The communist rally mentioned above points to awareness of what Karl Marx called industrial stratification or class struggle. According to Marx, in pre-industrial states, elites controlled the state machinery. With industrial states, elites owned the means of production. And by means of production, Marx meant pr property, factory buildings, machines, materials used in production, and capital, that is, the funds used to purchase the means of production. Marx saw this trend as an expression of a fundamental capitalist opposition between the bourgeoisie, or the capitalists, the owners, and the proletariat, the propertyless workers who sold their labor to the capitalists for wages. The bourgeoisie on the means of production and the working class or proletariat had to sell labor to survive. And then we can refer to the process of proletarianization as the separation of workers from the means of production. Max Weber the early 20th century sociologist, argued that Marx's model was oversimplified. He developed a model with three main factors contributing to socioeconomic stratification. Wealth or economic status, power or political status, and prestige or social status. French scholar Pierre Bourdieu refers to prestige as cultural capital. It includes both knowledge, but also the symbols, right, of um, power. Weber identified several dimensions of social stratification. Again, wealth or economic status, political status based on power, social status based on prestige. And contrary to Marx, Weber argued that social solidarity was not necessarily based on class, but also on ethnicity, religion, race, nationality, and other attributes, all of which we are studying in this course on cultural diversity in the United States. Are Americans willing to talk about class, or are we unwilling? Kotak and Kazaitis referred to our collective unwillingness to talk about class, and according to anthropologist Paul Durenberger, the paradox of studying class in America is the denial of classes. Our folk models tell us that the thing we want to understand doesn't exist. We think that social mobility is based on character and hard work, and that's written into our institutions as well as our constitution, our popular sayings, and our myths, right? And all of these sort of move against the willingness to recognize class differences here. Anthropologist Kirby Moss notes how uncomfortable it is to deal with class in the U.S. without smearing in color. Moss wrote on a Midwestern working class community and he points to the intersection of race and class in the United States.
Kotak and Kazaitis suggest that class and class labels, yuppies, the rich, elites, white collar, blue collar, working poor, the homeless, rednecks, welfare moms, and so on, are widely used, but are coupled with a simultaneous unwillingness to discuss them. In the post-World War II industrial economy, manufacturing jobs provided a good income but it has become much more difficult for a mere high school graduate to earn enough to support a family these days. The authors also note a widening income gap in the U.S. between the wealthy and the poor. Kotak and Kazaitis note that among developed countries, the U.S. has a high poverty rate based on 2016 estimates over 43.6 million or 13.5% of Americans live in poverty. Poverty declined between 1993 and 2000, but rose between 2000 and 2010. Although poverty declined in the 1990s, the gap between the rich and poor has continued to widen. And homelessness is an extreme form of downward mobility, according to the National Alliance to End Homelessness. In January, 2016, 549,928 people were homeless on a given night in the United States. Most Americans, regardless of income, consider themselves to be middle class. Americans have trouble dealing with or even recognizing class differences. With their ideology of equality, Americans feel uneasy using such labels as lower class, working class, or upper class. This differs from Brazil, where there are marked differences between socioeconomic classes. Menial jobs should be done by menials, millions of whom are available. Historically and cross-culturally, the poor have been classified as functionally and morally inferior to their more prosperous counterparts. How much attention do we pay to diversity among whites? Stereotypes about poor southern whites have fueled the idea of a, quote, white trash culture. The experience of poor rural whites is different from and less than the societal norm may be as painful and destructive as the experience of poor urban blacks. Class is a category denoting economic position and rank in a social hierarchy. Relative to the means of production, class implies social stratification and inequality. Capitalist state societies stratify segments of the population Subordinated segments may include racial and ethnic groups, women, older people, and people raised in poverty. Paul Durenberger again notes that the differences in wealth, economic conditions, prestige, and power are as great in America as in any stratified society. These differences are linked to minimal mobility as well as differences of life ways, systems of values, and attitudes. Goldschmidt identified four classes. An elite, a middle class whose power is derived from the elite and who function as, a lo as local pseudo-elites, doing the affairs, looking after the affairs of the elites, working as middle managers for elites, a working class that rejects the middle class ideal of economic advancement through individual achievement and attempts collective action for social gains, and an underclass, laboring people who are so hopeless that they do not expect to advance individually or collectively. Now I might take issue with that last point because people retain hope, as we'll see in the film in this unit. We also tend to adopt what many people call the folk model of meritocratic individualism. The term meritocracy 
refers to leadership by able and talented individuals. It's a system in which persons are rewarded and advanced. Some scholars refer to meritocracy as a folk model, myth, or dominant ideology that serves to exclude people who do not have power and that upholds an unequal social order. Your view of this ideology may depend on your social location in the class system. The New York Times refers to class as shadowy lines that still divide. The Times notes that class is still a powerful force in American life, and over the past several decades it's come to play a greater, not lesser, role in important ways. The trends are broad and seemingly contradictory. The blurring of the landscape of class and the simultaneous hardening of certain class lines the rise in standards of living, while most people remain moored in their relative places. Class is rank, its tribe, its culture, and taste, its attitudes and assumptions, a source of identity. For some, it's just money. Some Americans barely notice it. Others feel its weight in powerful ways. Detroit, formerly known as the Motor City due to its heavy dependency on automobile manufacturing, was a city with very strong class divides. In this 1932-1933 mural by Mexican painter Diego Rivera, he depicts in Detroit, right, Ford auto workers, right, in the Ford Motor Company River Rouge plant. And this painting suggests that he was highly sensitive to class divisions in the auto industry. My maternal and paternal grandparents in Detroit were small business owners and lived a middle class or even affluent lifestyle at a time when Detroit's post-World War II economy was booming my maternal grandfather, Perry Manning, an Irish Catholic, owned and ran a sand and gravel business outside the city, but lived in town. My paternal grandfather, Jack Cinnamon, a Jewish American, owned a supermarket in Wyandotte, Michigan, but also moved to the city in the 1950s. Let's jump ahead to 2010 right, in an article by Le Monde Diplomatique. Indeed, by 2010, times had truly changed in Detroit. And I quote, Detroit is a city in decline, shrinking, segregated, and now one of the poorest in the U.S., with a third of its people below the poverty line and health indicators equal to those of a developing country. But how to reverse this trend when the physical arrangement of the city in the form of a ring is part of the problem. It perpetuates social inequality by hemming the proletariat into an urban ghetto. 86% of jobs are in the outskirts, but a quarter of the city's inhabitants don't have a car. Right Now, Detroit's economy foundered as the U.S. went through globalization and deindustrialization. The population dec declined, compounded by white flight to the suburbs. And so here you see sort of the end game of Detroit in 2010. Let's now jump to Butler County, Ohio, where I live, right? This table gives an idea of current economic diversity in Butler County, where Miami University is also located. Hamilton and Middletown are small post-industrial cities with significant poverty rates, right, and lower per capita household incomes as compared to Fairfield, a middle-class suburb that is almost at the national average of income and college education, as well as the Beckett Ridge, which is located in Westchester Township. And here 
we see that per capita income and household income, as well as um, uh, college uh, degree rates, etc., is significantly higher than in the post-industrial cities, right? And again, this suggests to me the spatial inequality or spatial division of socioeconomic class in the United States. The United States of America, the land of opportunity, has the fourth most uneven income distribution in the developed world. Chile has the most unequal distribution of income, while Iceland tops the list as the most egalitarian. According to a report by the Paris-based Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the top 1% of Americans now receive at least 20% of all pre-tax income in the United States, which is double what they got in 1980. This suggests again that economic inequality is growing rather than shrinking in the U.S. Here are a few uh, figures from the Ohio Poverty Report in uh, 2017, right? An estimated 1,674,000 people in Ohio were poor. That was 14.8 of all persons for whom poverty status was determined in a poverty rate nearly indistinguishable from the national rate of 14.7%. 16.2% of the people in urban places were poor, compared with 10.1% in rural areas. And within urban areas, 26.1% of those living in the central or principal sites of metropolitan areas were poor, while 12.2% of residents of other urban areas, of other than urban areas were poor, of other urban areas were poor, rather. Sorry about that. 21.4% of four families received cash, public assistance, right? So a, a large portion of poor families do not receive cash assistance, compared with 6.2% of families not in poverty. However, such payments seldom boost families out of poverty. And finally, um, to end this unit, I want to jump to an ethnography of class, right? Um, so anthropologists in the United States study class. We'll be reading some examples of these ethnographies in this unit, right? And so um, anthropologists undertake ethnographic research on different socioeconomic groups in the U.S., for example, Rachel Hyman studied a middle-class suburb in New Jersey. She explored the cultural contradictions of the American suburban dream and everyday life in the early 21st century. And she asked, how do suburban Americans deal with the class anxiety amidst cultural, political, and economic changes in American life? <laughs>